Now, when the little dwarf heard that he was to dance a second time before the infanta, and by her own express command, he was so proud that he ran out into the garden, kissing the white rose in an absurd ecstasy of pleasure, and making the most uncouth and clumsy gestures of delight. The flowers were quite indignant at his daring to intrude into their beautiful home, and when they saw him capering up and down the walks, and waving his arms above his head in such a ridiculous manner, they could not restrain their feelings any longer. He is really far too ugly to be allowed to play in any place where we are, cried the tulips. He should drink poppy juice and go to sleep for a thousand years, said the great scarlet lilies, and they grew quite hot and angry. He is a perfect horror, screamed the cactus. Why, he is twisted and stumpy, and his head is completely out of proportion with his legs. Really, he makes me feel prickly all over, and if he comes near me, I will sting him with my thorns. And he has actually got one of my best blooms, exclaimed the white rose tree. I gave it to the Infanta this morning myself as a birthday present, and he has stolen it from her. And she called out, Thief! 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 At the top of her voice. Even the red geraniums, who did not usually give themselves airs, and were known to have a great many poor relations themselves, curled up in disgust when they saw him, and when the violets meekly remarked that, though he was certainly extremely plain, still he could not help it, they retorted with a good deal of justice, that that was his chief defect, and that there was no reason why one should admire a person because he was incurable. And, indeed, some of the violets themselves felt that the ugliness of the little dwarf was almost ostentatious, and that he would have shown much better taste if he had looked sad, or at least pensive, instead of jumping about merrily and throwing himself into such grotesque and silly attitudes. As for the old sundial, who was an extremely remarkable individual, and had once told the time of day to no less a person than the Emperor Charles V himself, he was so taken aback by the little dwarf's appearance that he almost forgot to mark two whole minutes with his long shadowy finger, and could not help saying to the great milk-white peacock, who was sunning herself on the balustrade, that everyone knew that the children of kings were kings, and that the children of charcoal burners were charcoal burners, and that it was absurd to pretend that it wasn't so. A statement with which the peacock entirely agreed, and indeed screamed out, Uh, Certainly, certainly! in such a loud, harsh voice, that the goldfish who lived in the basin of the cool splashing fountain put their heads out of the water, and asked the huge stone tritons what on earth was the matter. But somehow the birds liked him. They had seen him often in the forest, dancing about like an elf after the eddying leaves, or crouched up in the hollow of some old oak tree, sharing his nuts with the squirrels. They did not mind his being ugly a bit. Why, even the nightingale herself, who sang so sweetly in the orange groves at night that sometimes the moon leaned down to listen, was not much to look at after all. And besides, he had been kind to them, and during that terrible bitter winter, when there were no berries on the trees, and the ground was as hard as iron, and the wolves had come down to the very gates of the city to look for food, he had never once forgotten them but had always given them crumbs out of his little hunch of black bread, and divided with them whatever poor breakfast he had. So they flew around and round him, just touching his cheek with their wings as they passed, and chattered to each other, and the little dwarf was so pleased that he could not help showing them the beautiful white rose, and telling them that the infanta herself had given it to him because she loved him.